Robert. Nice, nice to meet you. Welcome, oh, welcome everybody. Thank you. To Good meeting you too. Value engineering experts. Uh, today we have a great guest, Robert Higgins. And uh, Robert, I'm going to let you uh, almost introduce yourself. Why don't you do us a couple minutes on your resume because it's pretty long. You're actually been at this longer than oh, I've been. Yeah. I was in engineering when you started. You know, so that's a long time ago. I've been in it. Yeah, I, I started a long time. Yeah, I started a long time ago in this. Um, I've been involved with the waterproofing since 1976, and um, and uh, and most of my work uh, early on uh, through most of the uh, mid 80s was underground and uh, waterproofing and bridge decks, parking structures, uh, dams, uh, underground uh, structures. Back one of the really uh, cool projects I was involved with. I got to go back to England a couple times where I, uh, I was involved with waterproofing about 60 miles of the London Underground Tunnel. So uh, I got a lot of experience of dealing with uh, moisture issues with concrete and uh, other types of uh, building materials. So on with us today is another footprint engineering uh, engineer, really. I'm gonna say he's an independent engineer with a lot of practical experience and is from Alberta. Michael McLeod. So we're both professional engineers and we hope to be able to ask you some good questions today. Uh, Rory, you know, tell, tell me a little bit quickly, uh, did you meet uh, Joe Shutterly through Rory? No yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I did. In fact, I met Rory uh, quite a while ago, it was well over a year ago. He was working for another company. It was a silicate uh, producer and he was um, enthusiastic and and he was told things that he believed were true. And he was wondering why I was a little bit um, reserved in my remarks, because, you know, although I appreciated his enthusiasm, it was misguided. So he asked me, he said, can you be blunt? I said, you want me to be blunt? I said, okay, here's some questions you want to ask him. So he went back and asked his company some questions and they couldn't answer him. He realized that he'd been uh, misled and he had the fortitude to end up quitting even though he was making good money. And uh, he, I don't know how, but he discovered Joe's group, and it was specification products. And when he introduced me to them, I thought, okay, uh, it looks promising because I've always uh, I've always liked the idea of colloidal silica because colloidal silica to me is an unexplored uh, technology, especially for concrete. And I, I couldn't understand why it wasn't because I was going to introduce that to my own company prior to me leaving back in 2009, but I decided against it since I was having some issues where I no longer wanted to be there. So I had them buy me out and I became an independent consultant at that point. But as I as I explored what, what Joe was doing and I was reading some of his things, I do what, I give an example, what I do with Tremex. Tremex is a moisture meter producer out of Ireland and they promote their product like most others do. So I was interested in what they were doing because of the, the background of their development through Trinity College and some other really you know, good hands-on patients. And, at, and as I got involved with that, I realized, wow, these guys are really good. I mean, and, and they actually understate what they do. That's exactly where I place Joe Shetterly and I in this, in this group. They've really understated what they can do. I'm really impressed because I did everything I could to basically disassemble what they were telling me and trying to find out what was wrong with it. Because if I'm interested in something, I want to find out, okay, if I'm going to attack something like this, if I'm going to be a competitor, if I'm going to be have a doubter, how would I attack this? So basically I put on my specification cap and then went after it. And I'm really impressed. Now you felt that nano silica had that potential, but where, where did you get that from? Like uh, Joe was basically come up with this in somewhat original form with Purdue University, and he has patents on it. You felt that it existed, but you'd always run into silicates before. Like I'm going to say spray lock because I sold spray lock as well, and that's how I met Rory. Okay. And they made certain. Uh, claims and you know i found it did work quite a bit matter of fact mike mcleod and i met through uh through a network that included uh 
a similar, I think they were, they make their product, uh, Mike, that product is made and you had a similar product that you had the rights to in Canada. Did you not know what was that called? I remember that was called Protectrete. Protectrete. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Same factory, I think makes it. Yeah, Quite actually, yeah. Sure. Interesting because no. Protectrete approached me a while back and asked me if I would consider making some uh, updated formulations for them, but I didn't, I guess they didn't like the prices I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that is priceless. What the heck? Well, you I mean, yeah. difficulty um, now. There, there are so many differences between silica and silicate. It's, it's amazing, even though they sound the same. And even among the, uh, the, the types of nano silica and colloidal silica you can actually have an organic base or an inorganic base. It can be derived from different sources. So there's kind of this bottom area down there where even that needs some clarification. So I'm going to be working on a white paper uh, discussing uh, exactly what uh, a good colloidal silica is specifically for concrete. Because um, if you want to know if it's a colloidal silica or not, colloidal silica on the upper end of the spectrum can, cannot have a pH higher than 10.8. And at, even at that pH, it's questionable value. So uh, and the sweet spot is right where uh, the E5 and the other products that uh, Joe has between 7.5 and 9.5, that's your sweet spot. Now, a silicate is really easy to differentiate because if you do a pH test, this could be higher than 11. It is not a colloidal silica. If it is higher than 11, it's not a colloidal silica, period. End of story. There's no argument. They can't convince anybody any that it is because they don't exist above 10.8. They become sodium silica. If it goes to the alkaline, it is no longer a silica. It's not a colloidal silica. And the other thing is uh, about a colloidal silica that I really like is it react. It is a true pozzolan. It means it has no cementing properties of its own. But what I really like is it's not, this is one of the things that I have issues with with some of the other uh, pozzolans is even though their, their good additives are also subtractive because what they tend to do is they tend to uh, draw too much water uh, into them to make them react properly they, they need a lot of water because the smaller the particle the greater the surface area and the more wetting you have to do it'd be like if you take a, a coarse coffee and you pour water in it it runs right through but if you grind it up real fine you pour water and it just sinks in and soaks up well it's the same thing the air, everything is like that so so the finer you make it uh the the uh the more surface area you have and the more it takes, and the more it takes to wet it out. That's the thing about a colloidal silica; it already has water in it. So what's really nice is when it starts reacting with the uh, with the uh, clinker. And I don't know if you saw my little email before I, I we started this thing, but whenever I'm giving a, a seminar, sometimes I'll just say, "Okay, what is this?" And I'll hold a bag of Type One cement, and people look at me and um, cement. I said, "Well, actually." It's not cement yet. It's a big bag of dirt. It's, it's clay, it's limestone, it's gypsum, it's got some other stuff in it, but it's dirt. That's all it is, dirt. And it is dirt until it reacts. Once it reacts completely, then it's cement. It is not cement yet. That is part of the problem. We think, okay, this is cement. We just add water to it, voila, it automatically turns into cement and everybody's happy and healthy. No, it doesn't work that way especially when you have heat involved. That's where I got to understand that the concrete industry really doesn't understand their product very well. Because one of the biggest pushes about 40 years ago was when they started really getting behind the precast concrete and uh, steam carrying concrete where this was gonna create the world's toughest concrete. Wow, look how fast we can get it out there. It's gonna be waterproof and everything else. Well, it's not. Uh, it averaged, uh, 20 to 30% more surface suction than plain old concrete. And they're baffled why that happened. And to me, I, I don't understand why is that baffling to you? Because concrete, basically, as it tries to form cement, it spins off what's called Portland diter or calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide with increasing temperatures becomes insoluble. So even if you put it in water, it doesn't absorb the water. It won't. 
So part of the cement particle that's supposed to be absorbing water, forming more cement, is now shielding itself. And even if it's soaking in water, nothing happens. It does not produce cement. So the hotter it goes, the more deleterious that is. In fact, in every single study, the last 50 to 60 years shows that uh, as the uh, temperatures go up, the long-term value of concrete quality goes way down. Now, we're sacrificing the long-term durability based on the 28-day strength test because 28-day strength tests, if you heat it up, look really impressive. That's one of the worst specifications we can possibly follow is a 28-day specification for compressive value. That tells you absolutely nothing. It tells you, oh, well, it's got this compressive value in 28 days. Okay, that's fine. But I guess you need that for a construction uh, site. But uh, it, for everything else, you're, you're basically uh, selling the, uh, the durability of the concrete. You're, you're, you're giving it away. So we're, we have a, a negative return on investment here as we're dealing with this type of concrete. And um, that's the other thing that the uh, colloidal silica does. By adding water and having such a small particle, you have this huge evaporation surface that allows for what's called evaporative cooling effect inside the concrete. And uh, this inside the concrete keeps the uh, gradient and keeps the, uh, the heat from uh, penetrating the concrete and causing damage like that. So I think that this is the only way to compensate for the issues we've had. I would love to see this in a precast concrete and see what it does for uh, reducing the suction of the surface. I think it'd be amazing. Now let's talk a little bit about applications and, and uh, you know, the challenge of E5 is it's, it's revolutionary. But it's obviously they got to build a, a company, and uh, you know we're going to help them up in Canada. We're not as concerned about anything with the states other than you know teamwork. Uh, one of the questions Rory wanted me to ask is, you know, why E five admixtures are the best solution to carbon reduction in concrete, and they claim to get down fifteen percent of cement. So would that be typically the summary of that? What, what would you say? Um, that's part of it. Uh, and that's only on the affirmative side. There's a secondary side that people are, keep forgetting that um, now that concrete's not as durable as it used to be, it has to be replaced and re repaired and everything else. Those are not being accounted for when you're looking at your carbon stacking here. Because every time you do that, you're adding more carbon to the footprint. So that's what we're actually competing against. We're competing against something where you don't have to keep repairing this. That is more important than anything else. You, now, you've, now you've backed up the need for repair because roadways and bridges are supposed to last 100 years. Uh, most of them need uh, major repair in as little as 12 to 15 years in some of these areas of the concrete. That is causing a, a carbon buildup because now you have to take more carbon you know, producing concrete and put it back in there, replace the stuff that's falling apart and you're wasting time and effort and, and manpower. So uh, it's, it's just terrible. It, that's, that's one that's probably more important than the front end. Great, the front end saves 15%, but the back end, it's no telling how much it's saving. It yeah, no, be, I get it. it. Be, the, the rehab cycle could be over. We could, we could end it with, with a product like E5. And uh, just for the benefit of our viewers, um, it's 80% less permeable is what they're seeing. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about flooring and different applications. So with 80% less permeable, I think there's a perm rating of, like Rory was explaining to me, it's like three layers of vapor barrier added in, which you're not a big fan of vapor barrier, neither am I. And, uh, but within the matrix, you're getting an internal curing effect. And maybe yes. talk a little bit about that. I mean, we're holding water, right? We're holding water, so we don't have the yeah. evaporative Correct. And the evaporative cooling effect is so underrated because when we were curing concrete in the Middle East, that's one of the um, areas I was uh, doing work with uh, before I left in 2008, they were, uh, they were talking about, you know, where they're flooding the, the surface and they were really upset because uh, the, the concrete was still cracking. I said, well, start fogging it. 
And so what difference is that going to make? We're, you know, it's wasting manpower. I said, no, just set up floggers and just let them go. They said, well, what's that going to do to improve it? How is that going to improve over uh, a, a water cure, uh, just pawning water on it? And I said, the way that improves it is you're adding evaporative cooling effect. Now, one of the ways uh, I demonstrated that was I had them on a, uh, on a uh, Zoom meeting similar to this, and I had e each one of them take some, say, take some water, put it on your hands. I said, okay, you feel, feel the cooling effect? I said, yeah. And I hold it there. The cooling effect is worn off, hasn't it? Yes. Now blow on your hands. Oh, there's the cooling effect again. That's evaporative cooling effect. So if you want to know, see how it is rapid, you put acetone on your hands feel cold. Why is it? This is just because it's evaporating so quickly. That's the evaporative cooling effect. You know, I had quite what? a bit of experience with that with humidification. And I sold humidifiers at one time in an HVAC business. And that, that was always true that you were going to cool uh, the space as well as humidify the space, right? Yes. So, so uh, it's, it's the change of state, you know, jumping in and, and grabbing those uh, BTUs. Uh, it's fairly significant. I, I, I understand it. And so let's talk about Roman concrete. This is always something that I, I would ask you now, are we back at Roman concrete? Like can, can we not say that this concrete will last 200 years? It seems to have salt resistance. Um. This, I think E5 concrete has the potential to last a thousand years. Well, that fantastic. So, I'm glad you said that because I was going to say 500, but let's say no, 200 I, I, no, it's, Roman concrete. It is more like Roman concrete. Is I, I, In fact, I would consider that E5 is almost in the geopolymer uh, category and the way it makes Portland cement respond because now the Portland cement doesn't act like Portland cement anymore. It acts more like a geopolymer which is the best of both worlds. Because now you've got the most commonly available cement that doesn't have the exotic prices, unavailability of some of these uh, geopolymers. Because even some of the uh, bad mixtures like fly ash and, and silica fume, they're going to be uh, less and less available as we go along here. Because uh, those kind of industries are kind of dying off and there's no decent replacement for them. And that's not a sustainable uh, model. So, so those are the issues with fly ash and, and slag right now, would, correct? We, yeah, and, and silica fume, yes. If you notice, I, I've been looking at a lot of these international studies, and I because I, I look at, through, it's called Academia EDU, and I look at all these different uh, studies from all over the world, and uh, the most common used posel right now seems to be metacaolate. Now, the reason why that's being used is because it's all over the place. There's places where you could just, you, you can mine it and it's just, it's, it's easy to process. It's easy to develop and ship and everything else is cheap. Thing is, it's still a dry pozzolan. A dry pozzolan like that demands water. It's really fine and it demands a lot of water. And the other thing about metacaolin is the labs love it, but the finishers hate it because it's real sticky. When you're trying to finish it, you're chunking around in there trying to tamp the, uh, tamp the concrete and vibrate it and it wants to stick to your tools and it's just not a lot of fun. So E5 actually makes the finishing easier. So I like it that we're going to be competing against somebody like a metacalin. I say, bring it on. Because one of the things that I really like, metacalin uh, researchers have really done a lot of good work where they were showing the, uh, the development of calcium hydroxide, for example. They have these charts and it shows that uh, in the first week, over the course of about seven days at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that about about 75 to 80 percent of the uh, Portland uh, calcium hydroxide will form. Then over the course of the next 21 days, you get almost 100 percent formation, and that's what that reacts with. Well, that's also what what E5 reacts with, and I think the reactions are more or less complete after about 30 days, and I think that in and of itself just because it's self-consuming for the, uh, the, the water and incorporating it into this, uh, into this uh, reaction, the concrete will be floor ready in a month. They don't have to wait three, four, five months anymore. This is for flooring, you mean, to put yeah. in the MVR code, market. Yeah. I think Michael's got quite a bit of experience with the MVR market, you know, the self-leveling and whatnot. So 
one question that came up in the last panel discussion, we're going to have another one coming up. Uh, hopefully you can make, and we'll get Joe and Rory who couldn't make it today and really put together uh, the, the final answers to these questions on application because engineers will be listening to this and they'll, you know, can I, can I put it on existing and, and in traffic topping situations, I believe that we should think of layering in the rehab market, but let's say on an existing where we've already done a poor job of that concrete. Yeah. What will we get when we put, let's say E5 shield on existing and when does it not pay to put it on there? I think it's going to pay at a relatively broad range of pH, correct? It's going to always improve the concrete. The thing is, we have to reconsider how much so now that cement has changed since as of 2019, which is a subject I wanted to bring up. This is probably the most important subject we need to deal with from here on out. The EPA attempted to force the cement industry into compliance for recovering flue gases as early as 19, actually 1988. 1990, but um, one of the large uh, cement producers told them that if they had to, if they were forced to do that, that the CDK, the cement kiln dust, that they were using, because what they do is they were recovering the cement kiln dust, and part of that is to re reincorporate some of that into the cement process. Well, cement kiln dust is very, very alkaline, and they said we're not going to be able to sell low alkali cement anymore. And that's a big part of our business. That's going to put us out of business. So they delayed that. They effectively delayed it till about 2002. So they started doing uh, gradual compliance with uh, with the different cement plants. And full compliance was probably met right towards the end of 2018. So as of 2019, the concrete industry announced very quietly that low uh, alkali cement will no longer be available. Well, translation is they can't make it anymore because it's all alkaline. What that does, when you place regular standard concrete and you have that alkaline, that alkaline uh, component in there, as concrete is curing, particularly in, in warmer weather, that alkalinity suppresses the solubility of uh, the calcium hydroxide, as does the temperature. So you have double duty going on here. It's really nasty. But even worse, as a cement it's consuming the water. That means the water content in the concrete is, is being lowered. And as the water content is being lowered, that increases the concentration of alkalinity, which reduces the relative humidity inside the concrete. And once it drops below 80%, cement stops forming. They're finding that self-desiccation occurring all over the globe. After about two to three weeks, basically the cement stops forming up towards the top when it's the uh, slab. So you're getting really bad surfaces. I feel that um, most concrete at this point is probably is deficient, if not outright defective uh, for the installation of floor coatings and, uh, and coverings. But we're actually headed for an increased rehab if we don't interrupt it, right? Yes. So this is the only way to interrupt it. So E5, uh, you know, it really is something that all engineers need to embrace, you know, uh, I, uh, I also uh, would ask, you know, on existing, is there any, so that's one of the key questions I had, like if you put MV, if you look at MVR for an epoxy surface or for anything really, uh, we're going to get superior results when we're in what pH of existing. If they're driving the pH in the wrong direction, it gets harder and harder to save that existing, correct? Yeah. And, and the thing is, the alkalinity increases, but it, there's not a reciprocal connection between alkalinity and pH because, unfortunately, the sodium hydroxide, which is the most common alkaline material in uh, CDK, is also very buffered. So at about 3% up to about 30%, the pH is, is, pretty, is pretty level. So you can have a 10-time you know, increase in alkalinity but barely registers on a pH scale. So, and and 3% probably won't damage a coating, but 30%, it, it's a guaranteed will damage the coating. And so we don't know what that is. You cannot make an evaluation based on pH. We, we do know that if we use 
E5 new, we're going to be able to put flooring very, very quickly, correct? If we yes. put a proper dose of E5 in, if people start waking up to this revolution and they, they want E5, which is quite cost effective, I find it uh, for what you're getting on utility, it's probably not that expensive to make, but uh, you know, Joe's done a lot of work and deserves to make some money on it. And he has very good values. I think uh, it's exciting that, I think one of the things you told me last week was you don't really need an epoxy primer if you have new car um, with E5. Epoxy, yeah, epoxy primers, generally speaking, are needed simply to get a bite into the concrete. Um, I don't know that that's necessary with concrete uh, tree with E5. I know there's a concern that people have because it's gonna be a denser concrete but they're confusing density with smoothness. And uh, cause you can have something that's very dense, but if you look at, um, if you look at uh, the calcium uh, silicate hydrate under a microscope, it looks like a bunch of little spike balls. So those, those little, those things, those look, they'll grab a resin really well. So it doesn't need to go real deep cause it's got a whole bunch of those little spikes that you're gonna hang on to and it'll get really good bonding. I had that experience when I was doing some consulting work for XL Brands uh, Adhesives. And this is back to, I think it's 2015, where they were uh, testing this dense concrete. There's a product called Eridus. And they said, well, that, it's too dense. We're not sticking to it. I said, well, let me go take a look at it. And anyway, I looked at it and said, well, you're within 10, 10 degrees of dew point. And then their head chemist, Gray, said, see, I told you. I told you. That's what it is. So what we did is we just put a fan on it, left the fan on for 45 minutes, put the adhesive back down. You couldn't get the adhesive off. It had better numbers than the uh, standard concrete because now you remove that slight film of water off the surface. It now had really good grab and there was nothing polished about the surface. It was just dense. So in that situation, would you need to uh, pre-aerate the, the surface? I mean, in that case, you most cases, I guess, you just you just pick the moist day, right? I, I just I just tell people said always do your your monitoring at time of installation. Said almost all your moisture uh, issues are introduced at time of installation, not beforehand. During every installer, every installer I've gotten involved with has reduced their moisture claims by a minimum of ninety percent simply by monitoring the site conditions at time of installation because. If moisture is being fed into the concrete, you need to remove it. And there's really easy ways to do it. Usually fans will do it all by themselves. And I've done this in really high profile, even in really expensive projects. In San Diego, there was this one project and everybody was freaking out because they had this consultant come in and said, you're gonna have to put in this expensive moisture mitigation and it's gonna delay them a couple of months. And uh, they said, it's still better than the alternative because each one of the 12 rooms that they shut down was going to cost nearly a million dollars a day. So this was really a, a critical area. So I went in there and looked at it and I looked at the specification in the concrete. I said, it's not a concrete issue. It's caused from the air. I said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, I left a digital hygrometer on while we were talking here in the room. I started it. I said, well, here's your starting value. And I showed them 52%. So now look what it is. It was 78% just from us talking in the room. The relative humidity in the room raised. I said, now the concrete's actively absorbing moisture and your adhesive has uh, water in it. So what it's going to do is it's going to pull into the concrete. It's gonna absorb it in the concrete and your adhesive and your conditions are what's causing the moisture condition. So we, we went ahead and uh, I said, so let's we'll recreate what they did, but this time we're gonna monitor it. So they went ahead and did the installation. When they started doing the, the application with the adhesive, the relative humidity in the room went all the way up to 90%. I said, it's going to fail just like it did before. And it did. I said, now we're going to remove it, dry out the concrete. Now we're going to have to bring in humidifier and fans. So we brought in dehumidifier, kept the humidity between 55 and 60%, had them reinstall the, uh, the adhesive in the floor. It went perfectly. In fact, they, uh, they couldn't get the floor off. So you used a dehumidifier. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other expression I remember from the fan industry is moving air is drying air. So obviously fans, you know, are, are key, which is uh, 
your point exactly. Um, the uh, what what do you think that we should do with with warranties and and do you think that we can get third parties to QA this stuff properly if we lay out the steps and the things to check? I always felt that there was a lack of QA guides in construction. Well, and, there is because there's a lack of uh, proper information getting out there. You have to understand the flooring industry is so freaking confused because they're giving this information to the concrete industry. It's just basically the blind leading the blind here. The information is fundamentally incorrect. It's based on uh, false precepts. And I challenge this. In fact, uh, one of the top experts in the country, I challenged them and, and I said, look, I said, I want, not only do I don't want to debate you and anybody else you want to bring along, but I, I am going to put a caveat on this debate. So, so basically, you know, there's a false precept that the, all the moisture is originating from the concrete. That is actually really, really rare. Most of it comes from the top down. And coming from the top down exacerbates the issues that they're having now with plain concrete. One of the um, primary, uh, oh, and I was going to talk about that where I was going to debate these guys. I said, okay, now my only caveat is that the debate be videotaped. There's going to be no restriction distribution of that tape and it's not allowed to be edited. I've had no takers. <laughs> because the, what they're telling us to say, well, moisture is coming from underneath. No, it's not. Well, look at the Brewer study. I said, yeah, did you actually read it? There's this, uh, this HR Brewer study back in 1965 done by the Portland Cement Association. That was kind of starting point for all of this. It was called moisture uh, issues from uh, on ground or something with on ground, whatever the title was. But anyway, it, there was an assumption and everybody did. And unfortunately, everybody's a headline reader. They don't read the details. And I was guilty of that as well. So I decided to go into it a little bit deeper. And then when I got the conclusions, the conclusions never said that moisture was coming from underneath the concrete. It said all the, the moisture damage to the floors is coming from the surface. What we were told is not true. I said, show me where it show me where it happens. They said, well, look at the contaminants that come up. I said, you are confusing transfer, transmission with actual migration of water. Don't do that. For example, I said, and that's a desktop I'm going to do in, in a in a video you know, to show uh, just to explain this better, so people understand that this that, that just how bad this precept is. If you have two containers, and we did this in high school, we have two containers. One has salt water, and the other one's clear. And you got a you got a line between them. Now it's now it's it's got a little, it's closed. Now if you open up that closed line, the salt it gradually migrates out and eventually it goes into equilibrium. Okay, did that water travel over here? No, it didn't have to. That is not the way that works. The way that contaminants work as they move through concrete, they just move through the water because they go from uh, high concentration to low concentration. That's just what it does. And then they're saying, well, water vapor is causing all these problems. Water vapor doesn't do squat. Water vapor can't carry salts. So how do you think distillation works? If distillation didn't work, uh, then, you, you were, then you're on to something. But if you want to get rid of particulates and solids, what you do is just you, uh, you boil the water, you distill it, you bring it back in, and now you got clarified water. That, it's the same thing. It's a it's hydrological cycle. People are, are ignoring foundational facts for fantasy because they want so much for this to be true. And I guess attorneys love people being confused and, and that bad information being out there because then nothing gets in these conflicts never get settled. And you got bad information, more bad information. And, and once we're done with that, we got some more bad information for you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's very basic fundamental engineering quite often lose track of. And I think it's, it's a, uh maybe a myopic inspection industry that they, they just get in the routine of charging for something and doing something. And, and in reality, maybe they don't need to, right? So. Correct. In fact, uh, uh, what I'm really proud of is everybody I've worked with, they've never needed me longer than, uh, than a year. <laughs> wow. Well, can I interject for a second? Yeah, you go ahead, Mike. First of all, I want to say, Robert, that everything that you've talked about over the last 
30 minutes or so has reinforced everything that I've done in my entire career. And so many assumptions that we made, you know, whether they were correct or not, that's what we were given to work with by people who aren't very experienced at it, but that's what they're selling. And yet, you know, we try to think like concrete things and you have basically hit the head at the top of the nail on every point that's valid when it comes to rehabilitation of concrete. Thank it's, you. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like I, I can say that I think I know, you know, a little bit about concrete rehabilitation, but you can't see the, the air between my two fingers. Compared yeah. to, you know, even though we've been in this business for, for over 35 years, you know, we follow what others are guiding us to do, even though we know that it should be done differently. And when you talk about water and concrete and the, and the problems that we have with water and concrete, it's phenomenal. I see bridges, you know, that have been built like in Calgary here that are less than 10 years old and the parapet walls are already failing. Yes. You know, it has everything to do with the water and the healthiness of the concrete and how they block that, that water as well. You know, like they, yeah. they coat it on the outside of all three, three surfaces and um, the bottom being tight to to steel likely and it fails so quickly so what what you're talking about and i i need an education on it and and it doesn't matter what age somebody's at you know i think there's people that need to convey the correct message and you you are doing such a fantastic job of it and i think martin making it available to the public uh, or at least to educated people are going to make a difference so thank you for that well thank you yeah. yeah, just appreciate it because I'll, I'll tell you what, it's like when we're going to waterproof that the H3 tunnel going through the uh, underside of the mountain in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, and the tunnel was leaking like hell. And they go, oh, God, what do we do? I said, well, uh, we, we can fix that. I said, how? So we'll waterproof it from the inside. So you can't do that. I felt like saying, hold my beer. <laughs> so we went in there and we waterproofed the tunnel. It's been waterproofed ever since. Wow. You know, and don't tell me what we can't freaking do because you don't understand the damn problem. Yeah, yeah. They never look at the chemistry of the concrete. Now, here's one that will get you. About almost 20 years ago, I gave a, a seminar over Florida State University, and there were some people there from the uh, Department of Transportation and uh, some other consultants from the their engineering department. And I boldly stated that most uh, concrete uh, studies that have been done, done the last 70 years have been done incorrectly. And the, the one professor goes, whoa, 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 how can you say something like that? I said, have you ever seen any of these studies differentiate alkalinity? And he looked at me and said, no, have, have they? They just say alkalinity, right? I said, yes. I said, why do they do that? I said, don't they understand that the K factor between this alkaline material and concrete and this alkaline material and concrete are diametrically opposed? So as as it gets colder, calcium hydroxide gets more soluble, but it becomes insoluble as it gets warmer. Sodium hydroxide goes the other way. It gets more soluble as it gets warmer, but it also suppresses the solubility of calcium hydroxide. They've never made that differentiation. So every time they get some fluctuation in, a, in the lab study, where there may be between say 70 and 75 degrees, they can get conflicting information and they've never tied it in with the differences with these two materials. They've never dealt with it. But if you take that and you apply that logic to what you're seeing in the field, it makes complete sense. So anyway, they, the, uh, the one professor goes, hold on, hold on, let me, let me go, give me 15 minutes. So we, we took a break and comes back out about 20 minutes later. He goes, she's right. He said, he, needed, he, goes, he just needed the time to process it. Why don't they know that calcium hydroxide gets more soluble because it's colder? Because here's the other thing, when they talk about freeze-thaw cycle and why the freeze-thaw cycle uh, creates damage, you know, and that they don't understand. So have you ever thought about the fact that that uh, we s declare that um, calcium hydroxide is most soluble at 32.5 degrees, but if you put in a de-icing salt, for example, you could actually lower its uh, it's freezing point from there, so it gets even more soluble. Did you ever think of that? No? Okay. By ignoring these basic chemistry of concrete, we keep 
repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. They keep showing hot concrete bad, but hot concrete good because 28 days strength is real good. Why are we sacrificing durability for convenience? Well, with E5, we don't have to. We'll get the same 28 day strength and keep the concrete cool and get around that issue. That's what I get so excited about. That's it right there. I mean, that, that's it in a nutshell. So these, so these parapet walls you're seeing that are deteriorating after 10 years over in Calgary, yeah. they wouldn't show a thing after 20, 30 years with uh, E5. So can you tell me, I'm, I'm a little early to this and I, I missed the last thing that you guys, and I'm not sure if you were on it, Robert, <laughs> like how do we educate people? And like a E5 sounds like a miracle and I would like to be part of it. And I'm glad that Martin introduced me to it, but how do we, how do we take it to the next level? What's, 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 what's the forecast for that? Well, I'm, I'm bypassing the usual suspects. I have some really good contacts where thankfully I've gained pretty good reputation over the past few uh, decades because the people know that I'm uh, obstinate when, you know, I can't be talked into something that isn't right. And th thankfully I do have some people that uh, recognize that. Uh, there's, a, there's a group, it's called SKIP, and not a lot of people have heard of, the, of this uh, organization. I knew of them because I did a lot of work with the Construction Specifications Institute through the uh, late uh, 1990s to the early 2000s, where I would give seminars at their uh, in international uh, conventions. Where, uh, but there's this group called SKIP, is Specification Consultants and Independent Practice. One of my friends, Ken Hersenberg, he asked to be invited for the 21st uh, for, one of, for, for another one of these uh, calls they want to get educated on this so what i'm trying to do right now and it looks very promising is for next year's skip conference i'm going to be able to make a presentation there on e5 and colloidal silicate and uh and also uh with ken's help is put together a performance spec now performance specification is great because what we can do is we can set benchmarks and it, even though it may be quote unquote proprietary at this time, it's not really because there are alternatives that can get you there, but they're just not financially reasonable. So as long as they have alternatives, that's okay. Because what you can't do is you can't have with most specifications for these independent spec writers, uh, proprietary spec that it just doesn't work and they won't do it. And so this group to show you how powerful they are, they're probably responsible for at least 80% of the specification work done in, in North America. Hmm. So, what's, yeah, so what's the acronym again? Is it SCIP? SCIP, it's called yeah, SCIP. SCIP. SC specification. specification Consultants and Independent Practice. Okay. Yeah, so we got, we've got that on for the 21st. Uh, it'll be pre-recorded and, and Showing and then, late and Ken, by the end Ken of the down there with some of his associates. So M Michael, join us, eh, on the twenty first, and we yeah. have some really good, experienced, gray haired guys from from Ontario that are were asking questions last week, and uh, we decided we would uh, try and accelerate Robert's uh, presence here. So Robert, we're going to give you as big a voice as we can. You know, I created a trademark uh, called a Rehabilitate. And it's a North American trademark. I have a number of trademarks and a number of patents. But that idea of rehabilitate was really about, uh, you know, I was starting to put spray lock on a base material. And the, you know, I called it layer one. And I thought that there could be a QA guide that would, you know, my original goal was, well, let's go after the rehab and try and make that last 50 years. Do you think that with E5, particularly with Shield, that we could get, and maybe even, you know, calcium aluminum cements with E5 in them, you know, can we, can we put liquid colloidal silica in a bag mix? Like if I take, Mike and I have done a lot of bag mix work. So we, we made, we mixed these self levelers, but you know, how would you layer it out? Would you, would you start with an E5 shield and then you would go with a leveler perhaps, you know, a dose of E5 in it. If we got a half a cubic foot of water and yeah. found bag, are you with me? So can we maybe work together and come up with a prescription for certain conditions and uh, 
that's really, I think, one step at a time is what we have to think about. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because one of my buddies from Mape, because they were talking about that as well. But I, you know, but Mape, they are so slow. They're just a huge conglomerate, and uh, trying to get them to move is like uh, doing a uh, U-turn in a swimming pool using a tugboat. You know, you can't, you just don't get anywhere. I think the value there is because all these materials, whether they're calcium aluminate or Portland cement, they will still need E5. Because one of the things about calcium aluminate, it actually generates, it's more, uh, it actually generates more heat than Portland cement does uh-huh. when it initially sets. And if you want to get concentrated, it tends to not want to cooperate very well. And it has a tendency to crack. So I think the E5 will be really good in that. What we did for old school, I don't know if you ever mixed uh, calcium aluminate with Portland cement, but that's what we used to make, what we call a hydro plug, where you mix it together. So there's a hole where the water's squirting through. You just mash those two together at a certain proportion, say like 40% aluminate, 60% uh, Portland cement with a little bit of sand in it. You jam it in the hole in about uh, 10 seconds, it solidifies and shuts the leak off. You can actually do things like that as well. And I think the E5 in there, uh, you add that in along with the water, it's going to give it uh, continued uh, density because then you don't get that um, friability that you can sometimes get when uh, things are, when they rapidly set like that. Yeah, I agree. And, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was, and we're going to talk about growths, like it would seem to me to make sense to put E5 in growths, like it's a smaller amount than what we might put in a hundred pounds of ready mix. But how do you feel about that? I know Joe Shetterly doesn't really want to go outside the concrete definition, but we're not going to drag him there with a warranty or anything. It's more a case of uh, like, even if you take shotcrete, can you comment on shotcrete dry mix? How do you see that working? Oh, I, I think I think for shotcrete, it's just, it'd be a boom. But what I'd love to do, and this this would confirm a theory I have. I think that uh, when they've used silicates in the past to help prevent rebound uh, with uh, shotcrete, I think the only reason why I prevented that is because it just made the it made the uh, viscosity more consistent and it thickened it up. I think the E5 by making the uh, mixture more uniform, I think it would stick better. So it'd be really interesting to experiment with that a little bit. I have one mix that I'm testing and I, and I actually put Sika NS Admix, but I, I don't know if I really need that in there, but I, I use AquaGel with E5. Are you familiar with AquaGel out of Ohio? The no. rheology modifier. It'd be okay. worth us talking about that at, maybe at another time because we, we want to focus on the E5. I'm starting to believe more and more that E5 is the simplest, most cost-effective first step the industry has to take and uh you know if we can save 15 percent on cement but more like what you said was lower that rehab frequency you know we, we all we can really do is take the step forward and i look forward to the skip discussion let's do that on the 21st you were talking about bringing who are the two gentlemen that you felt we could get on well, his ken, ken hersenberg and he's got some associates i don't know who he's who he's going to invite but um uh, it'll be Ken Hersenberg, and I'm going to also may invite a couple people from uh, Tarkat. Tarkat's the third largest flooring uh, manufacturer in the world, and I've done quite a bit. And in fact, I'm, uh, I'm co-authoring a, a white paper on silicates with uh, William Thornton, who's one of the uh, head tech guys at uh, Tarkat, because I'm going to put that to bed once and for all, that um, silicates do not function in any favorable manner as an admixture and you cannot use it on green concrete. Green concrete doesn't have any calcium hydroxide to react with. They get, oh, we have the calcium hydroxide. What calcium hydroxide? It takes seven days to form initially and takes 28 days to fully develop. So you, you really should wait uh, 28 days before you use that stuff. You know, what Because of what they're claiming, that's what the spray lock screwed up with. They think, oh, we're reacting with calcium hydroxide. There isn't any. You put it on fresh concrete, what calcium hydroxide? Show it to me. Come on, show it to me. We can do a uh, shield on time of pour. Like you have to get that, what do they call it? The finishing aid? You yeah. know, the lineup, it's finishing aid, right? And if you don't I'm get sorry, that, that, it gets too hard, apparently. Finishing aid, E5 finishing aid. I think it has an element of citrus in it. 
anyway, I'm jumping around a bit, but Robert, when you come on the 21st, why don't we do a, a little bit longer session that's industry definitive? You know, you can you can try to stage it as best as best you see fit. Let's try and hit this in two hours because an hour quite often doesn't do us justice. I think I think Michael had to go because he wants to get into the where there's a helix presentation, but you and oh, I gotcha. can spend another 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Um, Michael, uh, you know, he's very practical, very useful guy, and uh, I know he enjoyed what we did today. So with uh, with Helix Fibers, uh, that's another question I'll have quickly for you. And with Shotcrete, the future is quite bright. I mean, we, we just have to get away from rebar as, a, as the only thing. You know, it really irritates me. And I've done a number of discussions on it on my podcast where, you know, oh, we need the rebar because it's crack control. And so we're putting these mats of rebars in. And, and really, we don't need it for load. Right. No. So as soon as you take the cracking out, then all of a sudden look at the benefit because you know it's a thousand kilograms of rebar, roughly is six or seven thousand kilograms of CO2. And then if we reduce the cement, we're we're a long way in following what I set out as a mission. Current engineering, you know, lower CO2, and you'll save costs and schedule. A big pet peeve I have is the over design I see in Toronto. Like we're seeing uh, people address geotechnical conditions incorrectly. And we're seeing, you know, rock that I used to have uh, five, uh, let's say 75 tons a square foot design never failed at 150 tons a square foot. Well, today they go 50 tons a square foot. You know, what happened? It's the same rock. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, those are things I've covered on previous podcasts, but when we look at, Think a little bit about what these, what Skip would do with E5 and how do we lay it out so that there's certain vertical applications and we can say, you know, this is the first three things you have to think about and then you develop that into five or six steps, right? Yes, Yeah. exactly. So we end up with a specification that people will follow. And if they have that kind of bandwidth, if they have, you know, an association of that degree, you know, Robert, you can really make a difference. And I'll do whatever I can to uh, to bring that out of you. Well, well with, yeah, with, with, with Skip, one of the ways we can really differentiate ourselves uh, with the E5 and the other poslins, I said, look, the other poslins will work if the concrete stays cool. So so they're, they're, they have a workable condition. So, but the thing is, what we're going to do is we're setting up a performance standard for you. So they have to make sure that they qualify the site conditions so they can follow the qualified standard. And if they don't follow the qualified standard, it's going to be penalties. Getting us in on a performance specification like that is simple because we don't have to worry about temperature, whereas our competitors do. Right. They don't know it yet, but they do. Because as because as we go to start to qualifying these things for uh, for efficacy in the field, and this is going to be great. Because that's what Skip wants. They they want a specification. Okay, here's something we can earmark. Here's our quality assurance. And our quality assurance, we can also do that with Tremex. Because as you're doing the uh, you're, as you're doing the moisture testing, you're also showing said okay, it's going to be floor ready in 30 days. And if you use the catalyst, it can be ready in three to four days. And the thing is, what's nice if I present this properly to Tarket, and then Tarket will warrant based on the uh, moisture test values. You don't have to worry about picking up the warranty. You can warrant the bond. They'll warrant as well. Basically, they'll say, look, we're accepting this because we're sticking because we'll do some bond tests because I'll, I'll, I'll get that set up with Tarcat. We'll do some bond tests. If we get those uh, moisture levels, they'll issue their warranty. Now you've got the muscle of Tarcat behind you. You don't have to run this alone. The worst thing uh, a company can do like this is to take on their own warranties on this. What you want to do is partner them. Yeah, I believe that you know you can't have a warranty unless you've got knowledgeable QA involved, and they're yes. your idea of developing uh, knowledgeable QA guides based on performance is uh, is right up my alley. I certainly have lots of time for that. So give some thought to uh, structuring that, and we'll maybe go a couple hours. Eh? 
if okay got it topic is good then then we we have to do it justice and and you know it's uh i'm gonna put it down for you to you and me and perhaps rory to uh bring it in you know the week before we'll have to have it like uh, more or less later oh yeah i wouldn't even mind getting together a couple times before that and kind of That's polish right. the uh polish the stone a little bit yeah, we can do it certainly without necessarily always recording it. These things are always formatted and right. cost money, but you know, I uh, I think anything that you're saying needs to be captured and sustained uh, <laughs> over time. It's a great legacy you're you're laying out for yourself, Robert. And uh, thank you. My whole goal is to leave the world a better place. There were so many times where I could have given in to temptation because I did a lot of construction defect work, but I was on a hamster wheel. I was just running around making lots of money, but I wasn't accomplishing anything. Yeah. And then uh, people said, how can you walk away from something where you're making $350 an hour? I said, real easy. It's stressful. I was accomplishing nothing. I was just, you know, I was just punching a, a paycheck. One more application I wanted to talk about. In, in the early 90s, I worked on big well and canal rehab, and they had seven civil contractors. And we would blast off, you know, three feet of concrete or 30 inches, you know, you did drill the holes and you blasted the top to try and protect the structures up top. But then uh, they, they would put coil bolt anchors in and we used resin cartridges because, you know, we all thought, well, the coil bolt anchors are, you know, must be holding these, this mass that we're pouring back. And it really, it wasn't that at all. They were just holding our forms. And yeah, the way, St. Lawrence Seaway admitted that it was a thousand pounds a square foot of polo they were after. And that, you know, you can imagine they're probably getting two or 3,000 per square foot. Yeah. So then the anchors are redundant. But in that situation, we see a lot of lock rehab coming in to different projects. I know Kewitt just got a big one up in Sault Ste. Marie. No doubt they'll break off with a type two demo. They used to call it type two with whole rams and, and machine demo. And then, they, you know, the drill and blast was how they did this well in canal for the most part. And we drilled 80 feet and we would blow a monolith right off, you know, 80 feet by yeah. 80, three feet, it would blow off into big chunks and then we broke it all up. Would you say that in that situation then, what would really enhance lock rehab would be an E5 application of the nano silica to get into that matrix? Do we want to get depth? We really just want to get bond, right? Yes. So it's really an existing. Well, it depends on the uh, condition and age of the concrete, how much good it's going to do, but it will do good. Because um, e E5 at the very least will act as a primer. Yeah, I think it'll, it'll enhance bond. I mean, I guess the fact that they would go 30 inches or 36 inches depended on testing they were doing. And you generally get that, uh, you know, that, that late, that contamination at the face of the lock, right? And these, okay. mono, these monoliths would be 80 feet high and maybe 60 feet stepped walls built, I think it was back in the 20s, 20s or 30s. Anyway, I, okay. I find that interesting. Okay, you, got, you, you just remind me of a story. I was, I was working with, uh, with TRW, uh, this is about uh, 32, 33 years ago. So anyway, they, they had just bought a, um, uh, this, uh, this company and they had this uh this they had this spherical thing that they were putting together and they had this coupler they were the, and, and they were using electro uh plating and uh, electrostatic uh adhesion and all this other stuff so anyway they went ahead and bought it out and uh anyway they were they weren't getting the same bond numbers as the company was that they bought it from they said well how come we're not getting the same bonding number so well we had a guy over there in a maintenance who was prepping these things. So they walked, so they went over to him and said, hey, what were you doing? He says, well, that'll cost you $250,000. Forget it. We'll, we'll figure it out. So they kept going at it, at it. Because they figured he's a guy, maintenance guy. They'll, they'll figure it out. No matter what they did, they could not get his numbers. So they finally came back to him and said, okay, fine. He said, okay, but you're going to sign a non-disclosure. Okay, that's fine with that too. He said, okay, what did you do? Quite literally, he took the two pieces, the two halves, walked into the kitchen, took Zud over the counter, scouring powder, sprinkled it on the, a brush, scrubbed both sides, rinsed it off. So here you go. And that's all. Uh, get Make sure that, that it's stuck better. Just make sure it's clean. The thing is, the oxalic acid reacted with the metal to make it to where 
when it went to do the grab, but there's no residue of that left behind. So there's no way to know that that's what he did in his step. E5 will pretty much do the same thing. Basically, it'll create a really good, strong, cohesive piece of concrete. So when you go to stick to it, you don't have to worry about an interfacial fatigue or anything like that. And if I understand the charge of the E5 particle, it will almost act somewhat as electroplating. So it should actually attract it from almost like a little magnet. So the uh, coverage and the, and the contact surface is, is superior. But there's no way to quantify that other than it just, it just has a better bond. I suppose we could test it with enough money right? But um... yeah, but see, that's, that's stuff for, for fun stuff later on when they want to do, let's say like some confirmation studies and that'd be somebody like Purdue university doing that, you know, bring them back in because it would give them something else to do. And also we would, if you do that with say like your departments of transportation, typically what they do is they have a, they have a division that's called the novel projects division. And that's where you bring something in like that with an idea. So, oh my God, so we can get better bonds just by doing this. Because what they do is they uh, typically have a between five to 15% set aside. And what's great about that is you don't have to go out for a competitive bid. If they, if they get talked, if they get convinced, okay, this is it. Okay, talk to it. Let's, let's give this a shot. In the early 80s, there was a product called Chemtree. It was out of Germany. They plugged in and they went into the novel projects division, all these different states. My gosh, they were doing millions, millions of dollars of business without ever having to go out for bed. Worst thing they ever did was uh, finally get it uh, qualified. <laughs> Do you know if, I know Joe's done, uh, Joe Shetterly's done 200 bridges in Indiana and now Ohio's just given him another 20. Now those are bridge decks. Are they, what are they doing other than crack repair? They're, they're, they're basically going on rehab, right? pouring a bridge deck, but I don't think they're putting the colloidal silica on first, are they? Do you know how the procedure? I don't know that for certain. I heard they were putting E5 in, the liquid fly ash. Yeah. So that's what I'm hoping for. But I want to get more detail on that because if they're doing that, I want as much data on that as possible because that dovetails in with what um, I saw with the BT BTT study that was done in Finland when I uh, was evaluating Tremex. I was able to uh, put Tremex up on another level with uh, many of these uh, specifiers and users because the study they did was on bridge decks. Baseline was gravimetric. Gravimetric is by far the most accurate method of moisture testing because it'll tell you the absolute moisture content of whatever it is you're testing. They do that in virtually every industry uh, that you can think of, cosmetics, foods, it, it runs the gamut. But it's impractical to use because it's destructive. The sampling size is very small. So it's, it's of limited value in, in the real world. But when I found Tremex was getting identical numbers to them and, and the other ones weren't, that's, that's why I picked them as being the best moisture test. But what it also showed me it was the alkalinity was rearing its ugly head in there because even things such as a uh, calcium carbide test, which is the favorite standard uh, in Germany, was not given accurate results because what happens is sodium hydroxide can actually uh, tie up some of that water. Calcium carbide only absorbs what's called free water. If the temperature increases, it reduces the amount of free water that's available to the calcium carbide test. So it'll miss the water. There'll be moisture in there it can't read. Very interesting. Robert, we're going to sign off. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Okay. I know you, you're just getting over a cold, but uh, I look forward to, uh, to the skip longer session. And we've got some really good guys that'll have good questions like Michael. Okay, good. Excellent. Anyway, thanks again. Eh? All right. Well, thank you for having me. You bet.